Right, good evening everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Food Effect of Life webinar. We're really happy to see so many of you signed up and so many of you participating this evening. It really is great for us. As you may or may not know, this is the first in a series of Food Effect of Life webinars that we're going to be running in the new year. It's the first of six. Uh, the next one is going to be on the 23rd of January, so a date for your diaries. It'll be a little bit earlier than this one at 4.30, and it'll be by Hannah Skiggs of IGD. And this will be looking at food labeling and understanding of front of packaging labeling. So this will be a really interesting, uh, really interesting webinar, and we really hope you can join us for that as well. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, we'd love to hear any questions that you might have throughout the webinar. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to answer these as I go through. There should be a chat box that will come up at the side of your screen. Some of you have already been, been chatting in. That's fantastic. Thank you ever so much for that. Uh, there's also an evaluation form that will come up at the end. This should only take you around a minute to do, but we really, really appreciate it. Everyone can, uh, can give us their feedback on this. We really do appreciate your feedback here at Food Effect of Life. And as this is the first webinar in a series, this is a great opportunity for you to let us know what you thought of the webinar. And there'll also be a downloadable certificate, your certificate of attendance, that will come up at the end. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. And I'm gonna begin. I'm Alex White and I'm an assistant nutrition scientist at the British Nutrition Foundation. And tonight I'm gonna to be talking about the Eat Well Guide. So what will be covered today? Well, I'm gonna get start by giving an overview of the Eat Well Guide and put this into a bit of public health context. We're gonna look at each of the main food groups that are shown in the Eat Well Guide and look at each of the key messages uh, that come with each food group, along with the main nutrients that are provided in each of the groups. We're gonna look at how these recommendations from the guide can be applied, looking at things like food labeling and calorie intake, and then at the end, we're gonna look at some links to Food Effect of Life resources. And this includes an interactive activity. It's one of my favorite activities on Food Effect of Life. And this is the Eat Well game. If you follow us on Twitter, at Food Effect of Life, you'll know that we love posting about this and we get some really great feedback. So we're gonna have a look through this at the end, along with a few of our other resources. We're also gonna give you some suggestions for further reading and sources of information if you wanna find out more, not just about the Eat Well guide, also about healthy eating in general. And as I said, there's gonna be a question and answer session at the end of this webinar for, for everyone to get their points of view across and to ask any questions that they might have. So to put this into some public health context, one in five children start school either overweight or obese. These are reception children. And by the time these children leave primary school, this is in year six, so 10 and 11 year olds, one in three will be overweight or obese. And these figures are even higher in areas of the highest deprivation. So uh, in the areas of high deprivation compared to low deprivation, there's twice as many children who are obese, which is quite shocking. Also over a quarter of adults are classified as obese. And this equates to around two thirds of adults are overweight or obese. And this is in both males and in females. There's also excess consumption of free sugars, of salt, of saturated fat, and of energy or calories within the diet. And again, this is in both children and in adults. And there's also evidence of low intakes of some vitamins and minerals. This is especially apparent in adolescents and in teenagers. So teenage girls, especially with some nutrients such as iron. There's also evidence of low intake of dietary fiber in the UK, again, in both children and in adults. Uh, quite shockingly, actually, the mean intake of fiber in UK adults is lower than the recommendations in young children. So we're gonna look at ways we can increase our fiber in the diet later on in this presentation. And finally, only a quarter of adults and only 16% of children consume their recommended five or more portions of fruit and vegetables per day. So what do the government do in order to combat these health issues? Well, these are food-based models produced by the government to recommend what we should be eating. In 1994, these were the recommendations, the balance of good health. And these were superseded in 2007 by the Eat Well Guide, which I'm sure many of you 
have seen or even taught about in your schools. And these have been further superseded in 2016 by the Eat Well Guide. So these are the current government recommendations. As you can see, a few things have changed between the Eat Well Plate and the Eat Well Guide. Noticeably, the knife and fork have been removed from the Eat Well Plate. And this is to show that the proportions of the food in the Eat Well Guide, the proportion of each food groups, represent food intake over a day or a week, and not necessarily at each meal time. So this is to show that not every single one of the plates you, you have has to be in exactly these proportions. Another change is this purple section, which in the Eat Well plate was called foods and drinks high in fat and or sugar. It's now called oil and spreads. And that section has been made smaller because the foods high in fat, the salt and sugars have been taken out of the main section of the Eat Well guide as they are not seen to be essential for health. Three of the other things that have changed. First of all, there's uh, an example of a food label in the top left hand side. We're going to talk a bit more about that later on. Uh, recommendations for fluid intake have also been included, as you can see in the top right of the Eat Well Guide, and also uh, the calorie recommendations for adult females and adult males, you can see in the bottom right. And we're going to talk about all of this later on. So, to start, what is the Eat Well Guide? Well, the Eat Well Guide is the UK's healthy eating model, and it shows the proportions in which different food groups are needed in order to have a well-balanced and a healthy diet. Now, as you can see, there's lots of different foods within the Eat Well Guide, and it's recommended we should be choosing a variety of different foods from each of these groups. As, as I said earlier, the proportions that are shown in the Eat Well Guide uh, should represent food intake over a day or a week, and not necessarily each meal time. And that's, again, to reiterate why they've taken the knife and fork from the Eat Well Plate, and it's now the Eat Well Guide. So who does the Eat Well Guide apply to? So the Eat Well Guide is suitable for most of the generation, the general population in the UK. So this is definitely what we should be teaching within schools, both to primary students and to secondary students. So it's suitable regardless of weight, regardless of dietary preference, regardless of ethnic origin, and regardless of religious or cultural beliefs. The only people that the Eat Well Guide does not apply to is children under the age of two, and this is because their nutritional needs are different, and we're gonna look into why that is and what the recommendations for children of this age are later on. Children between the ages of two and five should gradually begin to follow the proportions that are shown in the Eat Well Guide, so they can get a feel of healthy eating as they, uh, as they become a bit older, uh, and people with medical conditions may need to seek advice from their GP or health professional about their diet when uh, choosing a diet to follow health eating guidelines. So these are the five main groups in the Eat Well Guide, and we're gonna go into each of these in a little bit more detail now. The first of which is the fruit and vegetables group. Now, the recommendation I'm sure most of you have seen before, we should be aiming to eat at least five portions of a variety of fruit and vegetables every day. And that is the five a day message that I'm sure most of you have seen in abundance, uh, particularly in recent years. Fruit and vegetables should make up just over a third of what we eat each day. And uh, included in these groups are, in this group, sorry, are fresh, frozen, canned, dried, or juiced fruit and vegetables. So if a, if a pupil asks whether frozen peas or frozen veg count towards their five a day, yes, they do count because it's all fruit and vegetables consumed. So it says five portions, but what is a portion? Well, if you're teaching younger children about the Eat Well Guide, a portion is around the amount that fits into the palm of their hand. Uh, for older children and for adults, a portion is considered 80 grams. Just to give you a bit of a feel of what that is, uh, that equates to roughly one apple, banana, pear, orange, or other similar sized fruit. And that's around three heat tablespoons of vegetables or a dessert bowl of salad. Now, Two things that also count towards uh, the five a day are dried fruit, uh, fruit juice or vegetable juice or, or smoothies, but these can only count as a maximum of one portion a day. 30 grams of dried fruit counts as a maximum of one portion a day, and it's recommended that this should be consumed with meals. Uh, and this goes the same for fruit and vegetable juice or smoothies. So 150 milliliter glass of fruit, vegetable juice or smoothies 
counts as a maximum of one portion a day. But again, this should be consumed with meals in order to reduce the risk of tooth decay. And that's because fruit juice and smoothies and dried fruit are a source of free sugars. And we talked a little bit about that for a public health context earlier on, that we're consuming an excess of free sugars in the UK. So the next group is the potatoes, bread, rice, pasta, and other starchy carbohydrates group. Now it's recommended that we should be basing our meals on these types of foods and choosing whole grain versions where possible. So why should we choose whole grain foods? Well, whole grain foods contain more fiber, and we, again, we looked at that from a public health perspective earlier. We should be trying to increase the amount of fiber we get in our diet. And they contain more fiber than white or refined starchy foods. And often they contain more of other nutrients such as B vitamins. So if we're choosing these high fiber whole grain varieties, how can we do this in our diet? Well, types of whole grain food include wholemeal and whole grain bread, whole wheat pasta, brown rice, or whole grain breakfast cereals and whole oats. We've got a few examples of ways in which we can incorporate this into our diet and incorporate these whole grain varieties of foods uh, within each meal. So an example would be to start the day with a whole grain breakfast cereal, remembering to choose one lower in fat, salt and free sugars. You could have a sandwich for lunch, making sure that you choose whole grain bread if possible. And you can have, uh, you can round off your day with potatoes, pasta, or rice as a base for your evening meal. So these types of foods should be making over, again, just, our, just over a third of the food we eat. So the next group we're gonna look at is the beans, pulses, fish, eggs, meat, and other proteins group. Again, we should be eating some of these within our diet. And this is because these foods are sources of protein and vitamins and minerals. The only specific requirement for this group is to try and uh, consume two portions of fish every week, one of which should be oily fish. And this is because oily fish is one of the main sources of long chain omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. So a portion of fish is 140 grams. So you should be trying to consume two portions of 140 grams every week, one of which should be oily. Uh, when looking at the meat in this section, uh, it's important to remember that some types of meat can be high in fat and particularly saturated fat. Uh, so when you're buying meat, remember the type of cut or meat product you choose and how long you cook it can make a big difference. So a few suggestions on ways to cut down on this fat is choose lean cuts of meat and go for leaner mints to cut the fat off meat and the skin off chicken to try and grill meat and fish instead of frying it or to have a boiled or poached egg instead of a fried egg if you're choosing eggs uh, as opposed to meat. There's one more recommendation um, and that's if you're a high consumer of red or processed meat. Processed meat is defined as sausages, bacon, cured meats and reformed meat products. So if you're a high consumer, if you're consuming over 90 grams of red or processed meat per day, it's recommended that you should try and cut back to no more than 70 grams per day. And this is because there's evidence of a link between red and processed meat consumption in high amounts and colorectal cancer. The next group we're gonna be looking at is this dairy and alternatives group. So again, it's recommended that we have some of this in our diet as they're sources of protein and vitamins. They're also a source of calcium, which is important to help keep our bones strong. And they're also a source of iodine. And actually dairy products are, are one of the main sources of iodine within our diets. So again, it's important to remember that some dairy food can be high in fat and in saturated fat. There are plenty of lower fat options that we can choose from. As you can see in the, in the picture on your screens, semi-skimmed milk or even skimmed milk, low-fat soft cheese and plain low-fat yogurt are examples. When, uh, when choosing yogurts, it's important again to look at lower sugar options because some companies, if you're... Um, if you're reducing the fat, you might increase the sugar to try and maintain, maintain the flavor. So the next section, the smallest and thinnest section on the Eat Well Guide is the oil and spread section. So we should be, uh, we should be choosing unsaturated oils and spreads and eating foods from this group in small amounts. So this is because the, all types of fat are high in energy, whether they be saturated fat or unsaturated fat. So, of course, some diet in the fat is essential, 
uh, but generally we're eating too much saturated fat as we discussed earlier and therefore we need to reduce our consumption. Um, one of the best ways of doing this or one of the ways of doing this is swapping uh, the saturated fats in our diet with polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fats. And these unsaturated fats are usually from plant, plant sources and are in liquid form as oil. So examples, as you can see on your screen, is vegetable oil, but also rapeseed oil and olive oil. So um, choosing lower fat spreads is also important rather than, uh, rather than something like butter, which would actually fit into the next group we're going to talk about, the foods high in fat, salt and sugars is a good way to reduce your saturated fat intake. So the next group we're gonna look at is, uh, is the group we talked about earlier when discussing the eat well plate. This is the foods high in fat, salt and sugars. As we said earlier in 2007 with the eat well plate, this group was seen in the main part of the, of the plate as it was then or the guide, uh, but now it's been removed to the outside and as I said, this is because these types of foods are not essential for health. Throughout the UK, we consume excess amounts of saturated fat, of salt, and of free sugars. That's why if we are gonna consume these types of foods, we should be having these less often and in smaller amounts. So what foods are included in this group? You can see a few of them on your screen, uh, but these types of foods include chocolate, cake, biscuits, sugar sweet and soft drinks, uh, butter, as we spoke about earlier, and uh, an ice cream. If you do consume these foods often, again, it's important to limit their consumption uh, and you should be trying to have these less often. Foods and drinks high in fat and sugar can also contain a lot of energy, it's particularly when you have larger servings. So it's very important to check the label and avoid foods which are high in fat, salt, and sugar. And we're gonna have a look, little look in a second about how we can do that, how we can use food labels in order to help us make healthier choices. So there's also requirements and recommendations for fluid intake within, uh, within the Eat Well Guide. Uh, it's recommended that we should be drinking six to eight cups or glasses of fluid every single day. And, uh, and this includes water, lower fat milk, sugar-free drinks, uh, which includes tea and coffee. So it's not just water, it's important to remember, it's all of these types of drinks. Uh, as we said earlier, fruit juice, vegetable juice and smoothies do count towards your fluid consumption, like they count towards uh, one of your five a day. However, uh, we should be trying to limit these to a combined total of 150 millilitres per day. And this is because, as we discussed earlier, they're a source of free sugars. Sugary drinks are one of the main contributors to excess sugar consumption amongst children and adults in the UK. So this is especially apparent in teenagers, and that's why in the Eat Well Guide it says we should be looking at sugar-free drinks as opposed to these sugary drinks. And we can aim to swap sugary soft drinks for either diet or sugar-free or no added sugar varieties to try and reduce this free sugar intake, which is especially high uh, in teenagers from these from these sugar sweet and soft drinks. So one of the other aspects of the Eat Well Guide is this here, the energy requirements that are seen in the bottom right of the Eat Well Guide. Now, it's important to remember that these recommendations are for adults. So an average size adult female should be, trying, should be consuming 2000 calories a day. An average size adult male should be looking at 2500 calories per day. And of course, children should be consuming less calories than this. And we've got some resources on our website that can, uh, that can show uh, how many calories uh, children of different ages should be consuming. One of the aspects of this I would really like to draw attention to you is the fact that it says here, all foods and all drinks. I think energy or calorie consumption can often be thought of as, as purely food. It's important to get the message across to to pupils, there's all foods and all drinks. And that's why this orange uh, barrier goes all the way around the outside to show that it includes every single thing that is in the Eat Well Guide, fluid and, and food. So this is the food labeling that, uh, that is on the Eat Well Guide, and this can help us make healthier choices. So this is called the traffic light labeling system. 
and much like a traffic light, which has got green, amber, and red on each of the fat, saturates, sugars, and salt labels on packages. So we should be aiming to try and consume more greens and ambers and try and reduce the amount of reds, which uh, are indicative of high sugar, fat, saturated fat, or salt uh, within that food. So this can really, really help us. Uh, in our next webinar, we're going to a little bit more detail about, um, about food labeling and front of pack labeling, but this can really help us make healthier choices uh, when choosing foods. So how about the recommendations for children one to three years? We spoke a little bit about this earlier, how children under two um, have different dietary needs, how cho children between the ages of two and five should gradually be trying to follow uh, the recommendations of the Eat Well Guide. Uh, but these are the recommendations for toddlers age one to three. These recommendations are because they're children of this age are growing and developing quickly. So it's important that they get all the nutrients that they need, as well as getting the habit of eat, eating a healthy and varied diet. Now, as you can see, there's some similarities to the way it looks to the Eat Well Guide. But rather than the five food groups that we saw in the Eat Well Guide, there's four main food groups. And toddlers of the ages of one to three should be trying to get five portions of starchy foods per day, five portions of fruits and vegetables, three portions of dairy foods, and two portions of protein foods. And there's examples of what these include on the far left-hand side of the diagram. Now, the only, only difference to this is if a child is vegetarian, they should be trying to get three portions of these protein foods to make sure that they get enough protein, enough varied protein source within their diet. So children between the ages of one and three years should be trying to get 14.5 grams of protein per day. So how about people who are vegetarian and vegan? There seems to be uh, a rise in the number of people who are vegetarian and vegan uh, at the moment. However, a vegetarian or vegan diet should still be based on the basic principles of the Eat Well Guide. So if a pupil comes to you and says that they're thinking of going vegetarian or vegan, you should say to them that they still should be trying to follow the basic principles of the Eat Well Guide. Of course, one of the main differences will be uh, in the meat section. So if you're a vegetarian, you won't eat meat. Uh, then there's, there's plenty of replacements and meat alternatives, such as pulses. Uh, examples of these are lentils, beans and peas. Uh, eggs, if a, if a uh, pupil is vegetarian rather than vegan. Uh, mycoprotein, so an example would be corn products or soya products. So all of these will be alternatives from that, from that group. Um, if you're vegan, again, of course, uh, you'll need to be replacing the dairy products within your diet uh, with dairy alternatives, which again will be in, in that blue group. So finally, how about people with different dietary needs? Well, regardless of dietary preference, of ethnic origin, or of religious or cultural beliefs, people should still be following the basic principles of the Eat Well Guide with their diet. However, to reiterate what I said earlier, People with medical conditions may need to seek advice from their GP or their health professional. Thank you very much for listening. That is, uh, that's the end of my presentation on the Eat Well Guide. There's a few uh, further reading that are on the left of your screen here. Public Health England uh, produced the Eat Well Guide. So um, if you want to learn more about the Eat Well Guide, that could be a fantastic place to start. Uh, they have some, some really good information on there and a booklet. You can work your way through it and there's a few other links on there. Uh, on the right hand side, here's a few resources that we've got at Food Effect of Life. We've got the Eat Well Challenge, which we'll go through in a few seconds. Uh, we've also got some Eat Well Guide videos. Um, and these, these are short videos, only about a minute or so long, uh, that explain the different groups of the Eat Well Guide. So these, these might be useful if you're starting a topic or starting a lesson on the Eat Well Guide. Uh, we've got our Eat Well Guide Kahoot quizzes. Um, if you haven't seen our interactive Kahoot quizzes, uh, these are really fun, they're interactive quizzes that you can play uh, with, with your whole class at the same time. We've even used them in the BNF office because um, they can be played, uh, played by a large group of people. But we've got one specifically for the Eat Well Guide. And we've also got ones uh, for other topics uh, throughout the healthy, healthy eating section of, uh, of the secondary area of our site. Uh, we've got Eat Well Guide presentation. This is for, for all years. 
Um, we've got accompanying worksheets to this presentation. And finally, we've got some Eat Well Guide posters, and we've also got a blank Eat Well Guide poster, which can be useful if pupils want to uh, stick different foods onto the poster and things like that. So these are the resources we've got. We're gonna really quickly go through our Eat Well Challenge that we've got. Um, that's on that's on our website. It can be found on on Food Effect of Life. And hopefully you can see this now. So if, if we take the challenge, uh, you get a little introduction thing here and you get 20 foods. You have to get as many as you can in the Eat Well Guide. So you get one point for each group. So for example, if you move the lean mince, you click and drag it into the thing and you get um, correct and your score increases there. So you can carry on doing this. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing because I'm not sure if anyone wants to watch that. But, uh, but yeah, this is a great activity and it can be used for any ages. It's just very basically on the Eat Well Guide. That's, that's the end of our Eat Well Guide webinar. Thank you ever so much, everyone, for tuning in. And we'd really appreciate it if you could, um, if you could give us some feedback, uh, fill in our questionnaire. And thank you so much, everyone, for, for tuning in to our webinar tonight. Thank you. So just, just one final thing, please remember to complete our short online evaluation and download your certificate. Uh, you can find the evaluation on the link, which is www.surveymonkey.co.uk forward slash r forward slash FFL web one. And the next Food Effect of Life webinar will be at 4.30 on the 23rd of January, looking at food labeling, understanding front of pack, nutrition labeling. Thank you very much.